Alright, we're going to look at some more face turns in today's video. In the last face turn video, I asked you guys to tell me some of your favourite baby face turns and as always, you guys gave me a bunch to work with. So every turn mentioned in this video comes directly from the previous video's comment section. These are all turns that you guys enjoyed and moments that you felt should have been mentioned in the previous video. So sit back, relax and enjoy watching another bunch of bad guys turning good. Ray Triller's Big Boss Man gimmick was inspired by his previous career as a corrections officer. Boss Man wasn't a nice WWF corrections officer though, he would lay down the law by cuffing his fallen victims to the ring ropes and beating them with his nightstick. Boss Man played the villain for just under two years but then he got the opportunity to turn babyface when Ted DiBiase paid Slick, the Boss Man's manager, to retrieve the stolen million dollar championship from Jake Roberts. On the February 24th 1990 episode of Superstars on the Brother Love Show, the boss man got hold of a bag that had both the million dollar championship and Jake's pet snake Damien inside. And instead of accepting DiBiase's money for the bag, the boss man handed Damien and the championship back to Jake Roberts. Instantly the fans accepted boss man as a good guy. He would defeat his old tag team partner Akeem at WrestleMania 6, he got on well with old rival Hulk Hogan, and he stopped handcuffing guys to the ring ropes because, well, that's a little excessive for a corrections officer, right? Surely a real corrections officer wouldn't do such a th actually no scrap that. Boss Man was pretty successful as a babyface but when he returned to WWF years later he was put straight back in a villainous role when he became Vince McMahon's own personal security guard. Well last week I come back to America and I hear about Magnum TA. A wonderful babyface turn here that worked because everyone involved was super over and the territory itself was white hot. Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA were scheduled to face Tully Blanchard and Ole Anderson in a cage match, but things took a real bad turn to put it lightly when Magnum TA was involved in a car crash that ended his career. Magnum of course couldn't compete in the match, so Dusty would need to get himself a replacement. Dusty Rhodes would attack Tully Blanchard and Tully ended up with a knee injury so he too had to get replaced, and because Arn Anderson and Ric Flair were already booked on the show, JJ Dillon had to step in to replace Tully. So he even though Tully's out and JJ's in, the horsemen think the cage match is going to be a walk in the park. On October 24th, the night of the cage match, Dusty walks out with an unlikely ally, it's Nikita Koloff. Nikita portrayed a villain from the USSR when political tensions were high but towards the end of the 80s, the era of the Russian villain was coming to an end, thanks to US and USSR relations easing to a certain degree. So Dusty took the opportunity to turn Nikita into a good guy. You still had a feeling that Nikita was going to turn on Dusty. He has this look on his face as he steps into the cage where you can tell he's still making a decision in his mind, but my god, the crowd reaction when Nikita begins attacking Ole Anderson is nothing short of amazing. Dusty and Nikita win the match, Flair and Tully's reactions on the outside are absolutely priceless, and the turn was solidified on the TBS World Championship Wrestling Show when Nikita announced that he had a lot of respect for Magnum TA. Just in case you've forgotten, let me tell you just in a who the hell I am! People enjoyed this one because of the unexpected hero's welcome Triple H received when he returned from a quad injury in early 2002. Hunter's injury occurred during a tag team match where he and Steve Austin took on Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit. The game finished the match while clearly in a lot of pain but afterwards he was going to need surgery and a lot of rehab. 8 months is a long time in the world of pro wrestling and there was really no way to tell how the crowd would react when Hunter came back. He was one of the company's top villains for years prior to this return so nothing was guaranteed when the game came back to Raw. On the 7th of January 2002, Triple H returned to Madison Square Garden and he received an incredible ovation from the audience, pretty much making him a babyface the moment he stepped out into the arena. You'll be hard pressed to find a sustained pop longer than this one and Triple H being all fired up during his entrance just adds to the moment. 
The thing is, Triple H said he didn't know how to act as a babyface. While DX had a babyface run with Hunter leading the group, it was still juvenile promos and antics that got them over. Here in the garden, Hunter had to be a little more traditional in terms of what he said as a good guy, and he admitted to feeling very uncomfortable during this promo. Still, it's a great moment and it's a great turn, but I echo Triple H's sentiments about his character. I prefer Triple H as a bad guy. It's quite a poignant babyface turn this one because it was also Andre's final WWF television appearance, meaning he left the big time with his head held high as a pro wrestling hero. We all know how Andre became associated with Bobby Heenan, and if not, check out my heel turn video. But through this relationship with Heenan, Andre also formed a tag team with Haku, another member of the Heenan family. Known as the Colossal Connection, this tag team was put together to make wrestling a little easier on Andre's body, and to also fill the void that the Brainbusters left when they returned to the NWA. At WrestleMania 6, the Colossal Connection were defeated by Demolition, and they also lost the WWF Tag Team Championships. Bobby Heenan began screaming at Andre, and Andre got blamed for the big loss. Heenan then slapped Andre across the face, and Andre lost it. The big man grabbed Bobby and he knocked him out of the ring, and Haku was also taken care of by the 8th wonder of the world. The fans in the Toronto Sky Dome loved it, and in hindsight, it gave us a bit of closure on Andre's WWF run. Deep down, the giant still knew right from wrong. This face turn was kind of done in two parts, but let me explain. The Shield worked for the Authority. Ambrose, Rollins, and Reigns were enforcers for Triple H from around August 2013, but the trio were also pretty popular since debuting the year prior. On the March 17, 2014 episode of Raw, Corporate Kane said Jerry Lawler was instrumental in Daniel Bryan holding Raw hostage the week prior in Memphis with his whole Occupy Raw thing. So Kane told Jerry Lawler to get in the ring to receive his punishment. The Shield appeared and they too told the King to get inside the ropes, and the Shield escorted Jerry into the ring where Kane was waiting to take action. Kane wanted to know if Lawler had any last words, but Seth Rollins grabbed the mic and he said Daniel Bryan won't be coming down to help Jerry. The Shield, however, always do what's best for business. Rollins, Ambrose and Reigns then turn around and they face corporate Kane. The crowd pops and a yes chant breaks out. Kane tells the Shield to stand down, but instead he takes a beating from all three men, and the crowd absolutely loved it. This all led to a six-man tag match at WrestleMania 30. Kane and New Authority members, the New Age Outlaws versus Rollins, Reigns and Ambrose. But even after this match, the Shield were still loosely associated with the Authority, and they were still being summoned to meetings by Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. On the April 7th episode of Raw though, that all changed when The Shield stood face to face with Evolution and Kane. Triple H said he didn't want this to break down into an all out war, but The Shield cemented their new roles as company babyfaces when they began fighting with the authority. Fans had wanted to cheer for The Shield for a very long time, and now there was nothing holding them back. Virgil was used as a personal bodyguard for the million dollar man Ted DiBiase, but along with being a bodyguard, he was also treated like Ted's personal servant. Virgil had no issues going along with it, but a slow turn began to form when DiBiase started treating Virgil with less and less respect as the weeks and months went on. Virgil wasn't happy with his employer, he realised he was being treated very poorly, and it all came to a head at the 1991 Royal Rumble. DiBiase and Virgil defeated Dusty and Dustin Rhodes, and after the match, DiBiase ordered Virgil to put the million dollar belt around his waist. Virgil hesitates for a moment, and then he smacks DiBiase over the head with DiBiase's prized possession. Now, if you so much as mention Virgil or Vincent nowadays, it's usually met with a smirk or a little laugh, but fans at the 1991 Royal Rumble went absolutely insane when Virgil turned on DiBiase, and you'd legitimately think the WWF had just gotten themselves their next big single star. Seriously, the reaction was absolute money. Virgil would get put with Roddy Piper to help fast track his rise in popularity, he would be a constant thorn in DiBiase's side during matches that didn't involve Virgil at all. And then, at SummerSlam 91, Virgil got another great reaction when he defeated DiBiase for the million dollar belt in Madison Square Garden. 
Reportedly though, his mic work and overall lack of charisma didn't impress Vince McMahon very much, and he was pushed down the cards throughout 1992, but for a brief moment it looked like the sky was the limit for Michael Jones. All I can say to realize we've definitely had a major falling out happen here tonight. While seen early on as another ripoff of the incredibly popular Road Warriors, Demolition were able to carve out their own legacy by becoming very successful during the early days of their careers. At WrestleMania 4, they defeated Strike Force to become WWF Tag Team Champions for the first time, but they also got a little help from their manager, Mr. Fuji. Fuji was very instrumental in the early success of Demolition, but he was also instrumental in turning Axe and Smosh into good guys. At Survivor Series 89, a 10 man tag team Survivor Series match took place. The two teams featured babyfaces and heels. On the heel side, we had Demolition. On the babyface side, we had the Pars of Pain. Demolition were taking care of the Warlord when Mr. Fuji opened the ropes and Smosh fell out of the ring, causing Demolition to get counted out and eliminated from the Survivor Series match. Mr. Fuji denied any wrongdoing when approaching by Axe, but when Axe turned his back, Mr. Fuji hit him with his cane. Smash saw it all go down, and Smash threw Fuji in the Axe, allowing Axe to body slam his former manager and giving the fans a reason to cheer for demolition. Immediately afterwards, the Powers of Pain, who were previously babyfaces, helped Mr. Fuji, and Mr. Fuji would then help Warlord and Barbarian win the Survivor Series match. So what we ended up with here was a double turn where demolition turned babyface and the Powers of Pain turned heel. After the match, Fuji Fuji said he was responsible for Demolition. Fuji made them champions, Demolition thought they knew more than Mr. Fuji, but now the powers of pain are gonna destroy Axe and Smash. Demolition became very popular following Survivor Series 98, but you gotta give Mr. Fuji a lot of credit for this one too. Fans couldn't believe their eyes as they said no, could it be? It was Lex Luger! The WWF was going through another post Hulk Hogan era by the summer of 1993. Hulk came back for Mania 9, he dropped the belt to Yokozuna, the king of the ring, and Vince McMahon seemed eager to find a new star that would replace Hulk Hogan as the company's resident all-American do-gooder. In Vince's eyes, Lex Luger fit the bill, and it appeared that McMahon only made this decision based on Lex's look and size, but do keep in mind too that Lex was still pretty experienced by 1993, plus his babyface turn in the NWA back in 87 went over really well too. The way the WWF went about turning the narcissist Lex Luger into a good guy was definitely done very well though. I love the overall presentation of this one and the concept was good too. On the USS Intrepid, the WWF held a body slam challenge, and to win this body slam challenge, all you had to do was slam WWF champion Yokozuna. The Steiner brothers failed, Satanka, Randy Savage and Crush all failed. Pro footballers and basketball players couldn't get the job done, but here comes a helicopter with someone inside hoping to do the honours and body slam Yokozuna in front of around a thousand fans in the blazing hot sun. Lex Luger walks out and he's wearing a Stars and Stripes shirt. The fans are already cheering for Lex as he steps inside the ring, but they go crazy when he pulls off the body slam. Fans were overjoyed when Yokozuna got slammed, and Lex's babyface turn had been completed. And we all know that Luger failed to connect with the audience as time went on, but that body slam on the Intrepid is still a memorable moment in WWF history. Lex Luger could now be your hero, but only if you want Lex to be your hero. And you probably don't. I don't really count this one as a full blown babyface turn because we all knew that this was eventually gonna happen and it didn't really feel like Daniel turned heel in the first place, but I'm including it here because a few of you guys mentioned it in the comments and also, it's one of the best moments of Daniel's whole WWE run in my opinion. I'm not kidding and I'm not saying this as a figure of speech but I legitimately got goosebumps when watching this happen on Raw. No lies, this is actually one of those moments that I felt. Daniel had been getting run down pretty hard by the authority, Triple H and Stephanie had been making Daniel's life a misery, and on top of that Daniel was also dealing with Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family. Eventually Daniel realised that no matter how much the fans cheered for him, it was never going to lead to him getting a big break against the machine, so Daniel caved in and he joined the Wyatt family. For a few weeks, Bran was known as Daniel Wyatt and he would follow Bray's lead, but deep down we all knew this wasn't going to last. 
On the January 13th, 2014 episode of Raw, Bray and Daniel were scheduled to face the Usos inside a steel cage, and it was on this night where Daniel decided to leave the Wyatt family. As short-lived as it was, the payoff was like something that had been building up for over a year. When Brian attacked Bray, the crowd lost it, but when he stood in the corner to begin a slow yes chant, the reaction was absolutely incredible. Bray takes a running knee, Daniel climbs the cage, and while I agree the WWE's production team deserves all the flack they get for their bad camera work and camera cuts, they've done an absolute stellar job here of capturing the atmosphere in the arena. The camera sweeping around the ring in the audience to show everyone chanting yes along with Daniel was absolute perfection, and it just further solidified Daniel as as the man in WWE during this era. I don't consider it a full blown face turn, Daniel was still babyface in my opinion during his brief association with the Wyatts, but seeing as quite a few of you guys brought this up and seeing as I remembered it so well, I thought it was worth mentioning in this video. I got here because of the heartbreak kid, I don't need a bodyguard. I'm just a sexy Again, this is one I don't necessarily agree with because I think there's been a lot better babyface turns, but I'm not just going to pick out comments that I agree with. You guys liked it when HBK turned babyface in 1995 after WrestleMania 11, and while the turn itself would have big consequences in terms of the WWF main event scene in 1996, it was a turn that wasn't originally supposed to happen. When Sean wrestled Diesel at WrestleMania 11, Vince McMahon wanted a strong kickout from Diesel after the chomp got hit with Sweet Chin Music. Diesel and Sean protested it, saying the fans are going to hate it when Big Daddy Cool kicks out of HBK's finish like it was nothing, and Sean elaborated on this when he wrote in his book. We told Vince that we thought the people weren't going to like it, but Vince wanted it, so that was what we did. When the time came for the kick, I hit Kevin with it and he popped up at 1. The booze came raining down. I knew it. Kevin grumbled. The next day, we had a television taping in Poughkeepsie. When I arrived at the building, Vince told me he wanted to talk. Sean, we're going to switch your baby face. What? It's because of the kick out, isn't it? It was a bad call on my part, I admit it. Why is it affecting me? I'm the only heel that you have, Sean said. They like you, the people like you, Sean. They like me, but they like to hate me. Now is not the time. You make the mistake and it costs me my career. I was not happy. We're going to have Sid drop you, injure you tonight, and you'll go home for six weeks. I was so frustrated, so bummed. We had told him that the people were going to boo. Vince, I said, I would never tell you how to run your business, but please leave the wrestling to me. Then I went and told Kevin what was happening. They're taking me off for six weeks. What for? They're turning me babyface. It's because of the kickout, isn't it? The night after WrestleMania 11, Sean told his bodyguard Sid to take the night off and Sid wasn't prepared to do so. So Big Sid dropped Sean with a powerbomb and Diesel ran down for the save. Sean was taken off TV for a while and when he came back to wrestle King Kong Bundy in a King of the Ring qualifying match on Raw, the fans were very much in his corner. The babyface turn worked out very well for Sean as fans began to gravitate towards his flamboyance rather than hate the guy for his cockiness. Like Triple H though, I always enjoyed watching Sean play a heel role in WWF, but he put on some absolutely incredible matches too during his time as a babyface. The damn people's champ! In the past two heel videos I put together, The Rock got featured in both uploads. I talked about Rock joining the nation and joining the corporation, but you guys also enjoyed seeing Rock finally turn into a fully fledged babyface when he said goodbye to Team Corporate the night after Backlash 1999. At WrestleMania 15, The Rock represented the corporation as WWF champion. He was always a proud member of the faction, and in Vince's words, he was the crown jewel of Team Corporate. Rock lost the WWF championship to Steve Austin at Mania. 15 and Vince McMahon would have his hands full trying to protect his daughter from The Undertaker's Ministry of Darkness, but Rock still remained part of the corporation and he had another opportunity to win the WWF title at Backlash. Shane McMahon, who had taken over the corporation from Vince, refereed the Austin vs Rock rematch, and it was partly because of Shane that Rock lost the bout, but that didn't stop Shane from berating The Rock the next night on Raw. Rock, of course, wasn't having it. So when The Rock spoke back to Shane in a way that only The Rock could, old Shane awarded the corporation to attack the former champ. 
Rock was out of the corporation for good and he wouldn't get involved with the corporate ministry either, although he would fight members of that faction over the next couple of months. It's an important face turn though because there was no swerve this time around. Rock would go on to become an absolute megastar within WWF and his popularity was only matched and maybe surpassed by Stone Cold Steve Austin at this time. I hope you guys enjoyed this one and if you left a comment on the previous video then I hope the superstar of your choice was selected for this upload. We have now looked at quite a lot of turns and I'd be happy enough to close this off by saying we have looked at some of the absolute best babyface turns in pro wrestling history but there's still more that I haven't talked about and there's gonna be more as time goes on. So we'll do this again someday but it won't be for a very long time. I'd like to cover more recent turns in the next upload like Wardlow's turn in AEW for example but again it won't be for quite some time. Again I hope you enjoyed this one though, thank you very very much for watching and take care.